For most of us, this is the First World War. Dense lines of trenches, tunnels, wire, and bunkers cutting through French and Belgian countryside that's been turned into unrecognizable hellscape by countless millions of shells. It is a distinctly European conflict. But that's only a part of the story. The Great War was waged on a global scale, brought to every corner of the earth by the mighty and terrible empires which waged it. To truly understand the First World War, one must go beyond the Western Front. This video represents my contribution to a wider collaboration between myself and six other channels where our focus has been just that, the impact of the First World War outside of Western Europe. This is part two of that series, which began in Japan and now finds itself in India. After this video, I'd encourage you to look into our playlist listed in the comments below, where you'll find the rest of our journey through Mesopotamia and ending eventually in Anatolia. Although naturally, this path only just scratches the surface of all that lies beyond the Western Front. At the outbreak of war, the British Empire was the greatest that the world had ever seen. Assuming one measures greatness in terms of scale and military strength, of course. And the largest, most valuable gem in Britannia's crown was the Raj. Of the empire's 425 million citizens and subjects, India represented some 316 million. But India was also a poor country, with vast swaths of its population living on a subsistence level and vulnerable to disease and famine. Unlike the mother country, the Raj wasn't industrialized, and in a war of steel and lead, her primary outputs were raw agricultural products like cotton, wheat, and hides. And of course, these were valuable for the war effort, but beyond uniforms and other textiles, India wasn't able to produce at scale the modern rifles, the artillery, ships, and other complicated pieces that were so vital to a modern war effort. India was also deficient in reliable motorized transport and in modern communications technology, which would particularly hamper its military when operating outside of any European theaters where it could rely on the infrastructure of its allies. But despite these myriad complications, British India sent well over a million soldiers and laborers to the war effort, as well as some 3.7 million tons of supplies, including jute, which was vital in the production of sandbags, and hundreds of thousands of animals, like horses, cattle, even camels. Indian soldiers, as part of the Indian army, would fight for the British Empire across the entire world. In Egypt, East Africa, China, Mesopotamia, Palestine, Anatolia, Western Europe, they would even be involved in a campaign against the Bolsheviks in Russia. Who were these Indians who marched across the world facing brutal conditions to lay down their lives for an imperial overlord? And why did they do so? To answer these questions and more, first we'll discuss the origins of this Indian army and how it was different from the British army. We'll look at their organization and their mission, who these soldiers were, and why they fought in the first place. And finally, we'll overview the Indian army's various deployments and the resulting difficulties which India faced both at home and abroad. In this video, which has been brought to you by the Native Oak and sponsored by Fabulous. Now, the term I've used thus far, the Indian Army, isn't entirely accurate. In truth, there were two major armies in India which maintained their own distinctive structures. There was the British Indian Army and the Army of India. And they're actually probably the opposite of what you're imagining. The Army of India were actually white soldiers, British regular troops who were serving in India, whereas the British Indian Army was made up of native troops. These soldiers were sometimes referred to as sepoys, as the British Indian Army maintained their own distinctive rank structure. I won't try to pronounce all those names, because as it is, I'm probably going to be mispronouncing an awful lot of things in this video, so I'll just list them for you. Ultimately, these men would be led by white officers, but there was room for natives within the command structure as well, especially as non-commissioned officers. British officers and administrators saw native culture as vital to maintaining control over this native force. The mutiny of 1857 was partially blamed on officers having lost touch with the men under their command, 
As such, it was required that all British and other white officers learn the languages, the religions, the customs of the troops under their command. They were even issued exams to ensure their proficiency. In previous years, these forces were far more disparate, being made up of three separate presidency armies. A holdover from the days of company rule in India, these were the armies of Bengal, Madras, and Bombay. But after the mutiny and some pretty dramatic changes to the structure, recruitment, and deployments of these forces, the importance of these three separate armies it began to steadily decline. It wasn't even all that much to begin with, really, uh, until Lord Kitchener, as Commander-in-Chief India, combined them all into one unified British Indian Army, which I'll just go on referring to it as the Indian Army because it's easier. Uh, now, these two armies, uh, while separate entities, nearly always worked in tandem with one another. Every division in India consisted of three brigades, which in turn were divided into four battalions each. Three battalions of those were of the Indian Army, and one of them of the Army of India, aka uh, three of native soldiers and one of British soldiers. And these British battalions were often better equipped and larger by a few hundred soldiers each, just some of the many precautions after the mutiny. As in the regular British army, all of these battalions belonged to fixed regiments, and they would be rotated between different divisions on a regular basis. So no one group of soldiers is ever going to get too settled into any one administrative location. Another precaution taken after the mutiny was a dramatic reimagining of the Indian Army's recruitment policy. Whereas before, recruitment was far more general, um, afterwards it would be largely restricted to what the, what the British referred to as the so-called martial races. And uh, this might just be about the most Victorian policy ever. Uh, after the mutiny, the army basically went through all of the various ethnic and cultural groupings in the Raj and divided them all into two major classes, the martial races and the non-martial races. Uh, the martial races were thought to be uh, less politically troublesome and more inclined to obey orders while still having the appropriate fighting traits and a, a you know, quote-unquote mercenary spirit. Uh, what this effectively meant was that the British began to specifically target and recruit from poorer, less educated populations who were more nomadic and often relied on hunting to make their living. These populations resided most commonly in less stable frontier regions, where tribal conflicts were common enough to ensure that proper fighting spirit. Uh, which is funny, in a way, because that same tribal conflict was actually the primary reason why the army even existed, at least in the form that it did. Uh, it was there to combat tribal violence, to police the frontier. Uh, but before we get to all of the chaos and the violence, as ever, let's take a brief moment for a sponsored message. The following is a paid advertisement for Fabulous. Late again, boy! Poverty knocks on your door, yet still you display a complete lack of I'm discipline. sorry, sir. I don't mean to be late. It's just that... Just nothing! I've already reduced my shifts to a measly 13 hours a day, yet still you complain. Oh, my feet hurt. Oh, Timmy lost his hand in the machines. Oh, I can't afford my avocado toast. Bah! Whinging and whining, the lot of its wife half a mind. So oh, please don't fire me, sir. What? No, no, no. Heavens, do you have any idea how hard it is to find good orphans these days? No, lad, I'm going to help you fix your horrible habits and start getting you into work on time with fabulous. Not sure I follow, sir. Listen carefully, boy. Time is money and I can't be repeating myself. Fabulous is an app, a, a digital life coach, if you will. It uses science-backed routines featuring small, daily steps to achieve larger, long-lasting changes to your life. Uh, healthy habits, in short. Uh, now look here, you're having a difficult time adjusting to my entirely fair, very humane working schedule. You can't wake up on time and it's ruining any sense of routine in your life. I suppose that's right. Well, Fabulous will help you build healthy habits that actually stick. It lets you move at your own pace with a personalized schedule. It's based off proper behavioral science. For example, look here at their habit tracking. It lets you choose from more than a hundred different habits, or you can even create your own. 
Then you'll receive timely reminders to keep you on track alongside online coaching sessions and support circles to help keep you motivated. With their dedicated programs, you'll even receive regular letters filled with lessons to guide your progress. Uh, oh my, so I can set a habit to get into work on time and to eat more than the same gruel all the time and to finally get round to taking up my chimney sweeping side gig. But, oh, oh, it all just seems like so, so much to do. Will Fabulous be able to track it all? Well, of course. Why, before I started using the app, I had the hardest time balancing my schedule. It's very taxing, you know, being an industrialist. Why, between managing all you orphans, splitting my time between four different clubs and societies, and of course being forced by social convention to spend every evening at lavish dinner parties, oh, I could barely even spare two or three hours a day to lounge in my personal gardens. It was awful. But with Fabulous Premium, I was able to build up and improve on an unlimited number of habits and establish a positive routine through their programs and exercises. Oh my, well, I suppose it's worth a shot, sir. Taking a small step to begin making a real change in my life. Oh goodness, it sounds like such a wonderful opportunity. Oh, and goodness me, I can't believe what I'm about to say, but look, I'm even willing to help you with the price. Oh, blast it all, I'll help the entire factory. Look here, lad. At the video description below. That's right, the description. That's where you'll find a special link for Fabulous. And if you're among the first hundred people to click that link, then you'll get 25% off your Fabulous subscription. Well, gee golly, 25%? That's more money than you've ever paid Timmy's family after he lost both his arms. Yes, well, what can I say? I suppose I'm just a Fabulous employer, aren't I? Now get back to work before I dock your pay again. Thank you to Fabulous for sponsoring this video. War is the task of young men, to sport with death upon the field of battle, to be as a tiger, and to draw the sword of honor and daring. The natives of the Northwest frontier refer to their homeland as Yagistan, which roughly translates to the land of rebellion. Technically, these peoples were under British rule, subjects of the Raj, Practically, this was rarely the case. This harsh, mountainous terrain was occupied by a collection of tribes which the British would collectively refer to as Patans. The Patans, or Pashtun, pronunciations, forgive me, um, were nearly always fighting one another, and the British both, uh, in what basically amounted to a sort of Wild West, but like ten times more complicated. This was the land where many a young officers would make their names through, legitimately or not, uh, dashing and courageous punitive raids deep into hostile territory. Uh, this was a warlike region, a mysterious region, inspiration for men like Kipling and such. And it was an excellent trying ground for the army. To give you a sense of the local culture, one Patan proverb would say, Of course we are brave warriors. Have we not sucked the milk of Puktun mothers? While another would read, The Puktun is never at peace, except when he is at war. The constant patrolling, policing, and fighting in this region was largely why the Indian army existed. It was a frontier army, through and through. For my American audience, you know, think of like after the Civil War, like the Indian Wars, the American army, you know, further out west, just going back and forth with the natives all the time. Kind of a very rough approximation, but it's always going to be fighting in this area, and that's why this army exists. It was designed to fight a very specific style of war, and it was immersed in a very particular fighting culture. Now, when it came to the First World War, a thoroughly modern European conflict generally waged in totally different environments, well, that led to complications, which we'll get to a little bit later on. But this gives us, I think, an excellent, a brilliant lens into who these men were and why they ever enlisted in the army to begin with. Now, obviously, it's impossible to provide any definitive list of reasons why people join up. There are as many reasons as there are volunteers. But still, a basic understanding of the cultural carrots and sticks, the, the psychological triggers that exist in the background of certain communities is important when discussing these sorts of things 
in whatever sense you can. Uh, and in this case, that a lot of these men came from the, uh, the so-called martial races, that's very important. Listen to some of these quotes from men who were fighting in the army and see if they don't evoke certain similar themes. If I die, I go to paradise. It is a fine thing to die in battle. We must honor him who feeds us. Our dear government's rule is very good and gracious. We must be true to our salt, and he who is faithful will go to paradise. It is our duty as castries to kill the enemy, and then a man becomes a hero. This was far from a slave army forced to fight by imperial overseers. Many, if not most, of these men went willingly to the fight. And just like in Britain, even boys as young as 10 would lie about their age to enlist, either as soldiers or, or in the case of someone that young, as, uh, as some sort of auxiliary roles, grooms for the cavalry and whatnot. What the British had managed to do among certain Indian populations was to mix local tribal and religious traditions with a loyalty to the emperor, to the, to the king. To be a soldier was, for many Indians, to join an elite warrior caste. It was an elevation, a great honor, in a highly stratified society. And regardless of the cause, you know, the Indians probably don't care too much about Belgium and the inter-European politics, whatever, but regardless of the cause, to fight and to die even was, for many, in, in many cultures in fact, a masculine expectation. And in that way, again, even if the exact language is a little bit different here, it really isn't that far off from what was happening in Britain and all around the world. Of course, there were also plenty of practical considerations for why men would join up. For many, military service was probably preferable to the poverty and the food insecurity that pervaded so many elements of Indian society. Again, the military is specifically recruiting these poorer populations. Like I said, as many reasons as there are volunteers. Even among many Indian nationalists, service to the emperor presented an excellent opportunity to gain greater significance within the empire and demonstrate India's capacity for home rule. As one nationalist leader said, If you want home rule, be prepared to defend your home. Had it not been for my age, I would have been the first to volunteer. You cannot reasonably say that the ruling will be done by you and the fighting for you. Even Gandhi, who had earlier formed the Indian Ambulance Corps for service in the Second Boer War, encouraged his supporters to offer humble assistance as we may be considered capable of performing as an earnest of our desire to share responsibilities of membership of a great empire if we would share its privileges. Now, unfortunately for many, this early enthusiasm wouldn't necessarily translate into success. Like I mentioned earlier, the Indian military was designed, top to bottom, as a frontier police force. Their equipment, their doctrines, all of it was based around fighting disparate tribal enemies in the mountains and valleys of the northwest frontier. The only other thing that they were really prepared for, really were training for, geared towards, um, potentially, was if the Russians decided to attack India through the mountains. That's a whole other story, though. When war broke out, even the armies of continental European powers were taken aback by the brutality, the scale, the nature of 20th century warfare. India was woefully unprepared. The whole world is being brought to destruction. One cannot think about it. He will be a lucky man who returns to India. Soldiers of the British Indian Army would fight across the entire world. Uh, perhaps most notable, and certainly their largest deployment, was in Mesopotamia. But Indian soldiers would also find themselves fighting in Europe at battles like the Somme and Cambrai. As many as 15,000 Indians were at Gallipoli, as many as there were New Zealanders. And they were in East Africa, Egypt, the Middle East, even in China, fighting alongside the Japanese, for example, at the siege of Tsingtao. I'm not going to go into great detail about any of these specific operations because we could spend hours doing all of that. Honestly, a great place to start is just the Wikipedia article on the Indian Army during World War I. Uh, it lists the seven different expeditionary forces, uh, where they all went, and what they did in pretty good depth, uh, and is a great springboard for future research if you're interested in any one particular campaign. But for this video, I'd like to continue with our broad overview.
All of this means that India went from supplying a relatively small number of men on their own doorstep to suddenly maintaining over a million bodies across hundreds, even thousands of miles of mountains, deserts, jungles, and oceans. Deployments like that are logistical nightmares in the best of circumstances. And remember, unlike the Western powers for whom this war was being waged, India wasn't largely industrialized. It was really quite poor. More often than not, the Indian army would be plagued by supply shortages. For example, without motor transport, Indian forces often relied on springless wooden carts to transport their wounded to hospitals, which rarely had adequate medical staff. Many of them relied on untrained orderlies rather than medical professionals to provide what little care they could with whatever supplies could be mustered up. The Mesopotamian campaign, uh, for example, began almost as soon as the war itself did, but Indian forces there went without nurses until April of 1916. And when, uh, when proper medical staff did begin to arrive, they found an army running rampant with cholera and dysentery. Out of a belief that it was flies that were spreading such diseases, nobody had been sterilizing the water. They were similarly lacking in communications technology, being unable to coordinate with each other at anywhere near the same level of efficiency as Western forces. And if they did have up-to-date equipment, it was often only issued to them immediately before deployment, and so they were unused to using it. Uh, issuing outdated equipment to native auxiliaries was a common practice, especially after the mutiny. And I mean, after all, why do you need the latest rifles or heavy artillery if you're only fighting tribal Pathans in the mountains? Well, it works for that, but then when you send them up against modern soldiers, it's uh, changed the dynamic a little bit. Of course, these difficulties didn't just spring up out of the blue. It was well understood before the war that any Indian soldiers deployed to Europe in a potential conflict would pretty much have no choice but to be supplied from Britain itself, not India. Uh, as a result, the incredible scale of India's recruiting pool would really only ever be of limited application should Europe itself fall into conflict. And with the nature of the Indian economy, uh, the relative poverty, the lack of proper uh, transportation infrastructure, again, when compared with Europe. As it is, you can only really levy up and, and mobilize so much of their population when compared to, again, the much smaller population-wise, but more highly developed European nations. But all the same, at the beginning, there were initially some pretty sizable deployments of Indian soldiers to fight in Europe, um, although it didn't really take too long for most of them to be pulled back for campaigns of arguably lesser significance that were closer to home, mostly in Mesopotamia. And that's something that may come across as a surprise to a lot of people. The Western Front was iconic, if nothing else, as a meat grinder, churning through literally millions upon millions of bodies. Villages would lose nearly their entire adult male population overnight should a single assault falter even a little bit. And as it was, by the end of things, the British would already be supplying like over five million soldiers, mostly in Europe. So evidently, the logistics were capable of supporting massive numbers in Europe, and if the Indians were going to be relying on the European uh, like infrastructure anyways, why not send over massive quantities of soldiers and recruits to help feed that war effort when you know the British themselves were so clearly desperate for recruits? Now, yes, the campaigns in Mesopotamia were important to the overall war effort. Soldiers from all over the empire, including from Britain, would fight there, and it was necessary, absolutely. But still, why were some Indian soldiers of that more limited number of the potential recruiting pool who were sent over to Europe, they were already there, why were they then sent away, redeployed, from the most manpower-hungry part of the war? And now, yes, some of that is going to be out of direct military necessity. In fact, a fair portion of it is going to be. But not too surprisingly, I think, in the age of imperialism, there is also an awful lot more at play when it comes to the Indian Army's application. I want every white soldier in India that I can get. On the 16th of February, 1915, the worst nightmare of any white officer commanding native troops was realized in Singapore. Four companies, roughly half of the Indian Army's 5th Light Infantry Regiment, mutinied 
After murdering two officers in barracks, they marched on the very prisoner of war camp they were meant to help guard and killed the Allied soldiers there as well. The mutineers would have near complete freedom of Singapore for almost a week, killing soldiers and several European civilians as they went until finally being put down by both regular forces and local volunteers. In the end, 47 of the rebels would be executed, with another 137 facing prison or transportation. Thankfully for the British and Indian governments, this was more or less an isolated incident, but it spoke to their deep-rooted fears of wide-scale insurrection, the likes of which had thrown India into chaos less than 60 years prior. There are many potential contributing factors to the Singapore mutiny. Uh, one inspiration among the poorly disciplined soldiers may have been rumors that the regiment was to be redeployed to France. By this point in the war, the enthusiasm was waning, and the men would have heard of the horrific casualty rates on the Western Front. But another possibility was infinitely more distressing to the Indian administration. That this mutiny of Punjabi soldiers, a martial race of great significance, was based off of, again false, rumors of redeployment to Mesopotamia to fight the Turks, fellow Muslims. Pan-Islamist sentiment in a Western-led army fighting the Ottoman Empire? That could be a war-ending disaster. Before the outbreak of war, a major foreign policy goal of British India, rather contrary to the interests of the other allies, was the preservation of good relations with the Ottoman Empire. And that isn't just because it was a significant buffer against Russian aims in the Middle East and Asia, that so-called great game. It goes back quite a ways. Uh, even the Crimean War was like kind of sort of a part of the great game. It's a, it's a whole big thing. But we can move on from it for now. But, um, but also because the Sultan, the leader of the Ottoman Empire, Mehmed V, probably mispronouncing his name, I'm sorry, Chem, uh, Ottoman reenactor, part of the collab, I'm sorry. But anyways, the leader, the Sultan, he's also the Caliph, the spiritual head of all Sunni Muslims. India had 57 million Muslims, many of whom lived on the frontier and made up the martial races. And in 1914, the Caliph declared jihad, a holy war against the infidels of Britain, France, and Russia. German and Turkish authorities knew full well the potential value of another mass mutiny in British India, and they sent intelligence agents across the entirety of the empire, at least all the relevant parts of the empire, to spread pan-Islamist propaganda. One piece of propaganda even went so far as to claim that the Kaiser had converted to Islam. They were really pushing this narrative. The fear of another mass mutiny was so great that at one point the British actually sent two divisions over to India alongside the redeployments of Indian troops. As the Viceroy had said, the Raj wanted as many white soldiers as they could get, even if it might have detracted from the war itself. And there were indeed multiple instances of British-led troops refusing to fight against the Turks, as well as further mutinies in Africa, um, although they were generally small and they were able to be put down by local forces. Uh, thankfully, though, for the Allies, most of these Turkish-German efforts were poorly organized, and the revolts that did take place for one reason or another went largely unsupported. A pan-Islamist revolution, a second Indian mutiny in League of the Ottomans, would never take place. Of course, religious differences were hardly the only factor here. Wider issues of racism would also plague the army throughout the war. Uh, now, sure, maybe not so dramatically as in the armies of, say, the United States or Austria-Hungary, but it was definitely a factor from the start. The British imperial forces came from all over the world, and it wasn't uncommon for soldiers to complain about being fielded with men of different colors, nationalities, and faiths. Uh, even between white soldiers, conflicts would arise out of things like differences in pay, uh, which was a particular bone of contention among many of them, uh, particularly between Australian and English troops. Just because the two nationalities were the same color, they're praying to the same God in the same language, certainly doesn't mean that there weren't extreme cultural differences that could even go so far as to hamper the performance of, you know, the overall war effort and the ability of different units to communicate with another one. I mean, let's be honest, sometimes it's impossible to really understand one another even if you're speaking the same language. If you're looking for the other pommy cobbers, you need to go up there and dip your lid to the bludger with the stripes. Where are the British forces? Uh, when it came 
to whites and non-whites, well, you can imagine how much more intense a lot of those struggles could become. Many white officers leading Indian troops would publicly praise the courage and the zeal of their men. They had an amazing, excellent propaganda value. But when they weren't actually at the front and in more private tones, the presence of non-whites in civilian society was actually pretty regretted a lot of times. A particularly common complaint uh, was the uh, interaction of these men with white women, and particularly so when these interactions were sexual, as often they were. After all, these were soldiers that are 4,000 miles away from home that we're talking about. Uh, some Indian soldiers would even write back home about their exploits, how uh, the prostitutes of Brighton weren't all that much different from the ones back in India. And uh, you can imagine the, uh, the stir that that kind of thing caused, especially considering that most of the letters were going through censors as is, and the British were well aware of what they were saying. Um, this fear as well of colonial troops somehow corrupting the virtue of white women um, would go well beyond sexual encounters. Uh, for example, when Brighton Pavilion was converted early in the war to a convalescent hospital specifically for Indian troops, gee how appropriate that one is, um, there was a lot of tension, disapproval even, uh, that these men would be treated by white nurses. And I'm not just talking about the British public here or anything, I'm talking about the military infrastructure itself, the officers, the men who are leading all of it. There's a lot of misgivings going on, and that kind of thing can affect performance. Uh, the prejudice wasn't so simple as black and white either. Even within the Indian army itself, between the Indians themselves, there were massive tensions between men of different social castes. Um, there were even cases within Indian army hospitals of higher caste men refusing to properly treat those of the lower castes. Um, but we are getting away from the core point here, I think. Uh, at the start of the war, as with pretty much every military, the Indian army's morale was high. The Indian soldier was viewed by his officers as courageous, disciplined, professional, and most importantly, it was thought that these martial races would know their place within the imperial hierarchy. And perhaps at the beginning they did, but especially on the Western Front, this optimism was ground down quickly. The Indian army was unprepared for modern European warfare. They faced a miserable climate and seemingly impossibly high casualty figures. By autumn of 1914, the morale was practically gone. Instances of self-inflicted wounds were skyrocketing and men were found malingering to avoid combat. And all of that um, while the ever-present fear of mutiny was growing alongside already powerful racial and cultural tensions. So ultimately, I think it comes as no surprise that most of the Indian contingent soon found themselves fighting once again on the frontiers of empire, and not, as it were, on the main front. Throughout the Great War, India would suffer just over 130,000 casualties, rough of half of whom lost their lives. Although this is only a part of the story. When the Spanish flu came to India at the war's end in 1918, it spread rapidly. The official estimate is 12 to 13 million dead, potentially reaching up to 18 million. Maintaining the war effort was difficult, costly, especially for an agrarian Indian economy. To finance the conflict, the average tax was raised from one and a half rupees, or the equivalent of 12 pence per capita, to two and a half, or 20 pence per capita, uh, an over 65% increase. And this was accompanied by dramatic rises in the prices of many consumer goods, such as clothing and food, uh, which it is estimated rose by 67 and 43 percent, respectively. The finances of many households were strained enough that many families would send their men and boys out of the villages and into the cities to find secondary employment in factories. Although, economically speaking, the war did lead to more than just rising costs. Uh, increased demand and the aforementioned shifting of workers led to a dramatic expansion of Indian industry, particularly in the vital wartime industries it formerly lacked, like steel. Tata Iron and Steel Company, for example, had only been founded in 1907, and before the war it employed around 4,000 people. But by the 1920s, it employed 30,000, with output expanded by literally a hundredfold. All of it to feed the Middle Eastern war effort. 
The production of agricultural goods, especially cotton and jute, was also expanded despite rising costs. Overall, Indian exports increased by 6% while their imports from Britain would fall, further encouraging the growth of domestic industry and trade with other nations particularly with Japan and the United States, both of whom by the war's end were buying over a quarter of all Indian exports, just slightly less than Britain's own share. Basically, the war meant more money in Indian rather than British businessmen's pockets, which in turn increases their influence in the Indian Congress. And this rising class of Indian industrialists were suddenly capable of pushing back against the policies of free trade that were so favored by the British Empire in favor of a more protectionist economy. Uh, tariffs and increasing domestic industry would in turn generate further revenue for the Indian government and lessen its reliance on membership within the British Empire. To say nothing again of the fact that the Indian people had felt that they made this great sacrifice, this great effort in this imperial war, and proved, more or less at least, that they were capable of fielding large armies and such. I think you can see where we're going, and we all know how this story ends, although it would take another war before things really came to a head. Uh, for the army's part, after the war, it would go back to doing what it did best, policing the frontier. Operations in the Northwest would continue, alongside new duties in policing the rich assortments of newly acquired Middle Eastern territories, uh, where in fact the army would put down a number of revolts and continue playing that great game with now communist Russia. Now if you've stuck around this long, I'm willing to bet it's because you're interested in the First World War. And if, if that isn't the case, well, I'm very confused, but I'll assume that it is, uh, well, in which case I have some great news for you. This video is only a small portion of a massive seven-part series between myself and multiple, six that is, other channels, where we explore all sorts of different topics going beyond the Western Front of the First World War. This is the great collaboration, and your effort, my friend, is required to carry on its glory. So repair to the playlist linked down below and continue along your journey. I've spoken a great deal so far about the broader administration and impact of the British Indian Army, but I know you. You want the specifics. Well, the next part in our series will give you just some of that, where my friend Josh will delve into the history of probably the most storied element of the British Indian Army, the Gurkhas, and their involvement at the Battle of Gallipoli. And of course, what better way to enjoy this magnificent collaboration than by acquiring a piece of magnificent great collab merchandise with a line of posters, mugs, stickers, and other products to demonstrate some of the wide variety of uniforms and peoples which fought during the Great War. Or perhaps something a little sillier is to your taste. We have the beginnings of a great new line, I think, the great mustaches of the Great War. Mugs and stickers featuring the real stars of early 20th century conflict, the crazy facial hair. If we sell these things well, we're thinking of adding a whole lot more to the mix as well. You can find all the merchandise and more at nativeoak.org slash shop, uh, where you can use the code GREATCOLLAB for 10% off your order. Thank you all so very much for watching, and most particularly to the Native Oaks ever glorious membership on Patreon.com. Until the next time, my dear viewer, I am, and I shall remain, your most humble and obedient of servants.